Hey there, welcome to Professor Pearl, a YouTube channel about knitting. And I usually say another crafts, but it's just knitting. I'm Nicole and I'm recording this on Tuesday. And that's a joke, not just a Tuesday, Tuesday. It's February month two, 22nd, 2022. And so in the United States, we would write that two, 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 two. So it's a lot of twos. And actually this entire week is a really fun week of palindromes. Anyway, <laughs> I'll stop geeking out and mathing out. So that's the other thing. I'm a math education professor and a knitter and a mom, and I live in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon. And it's really beautiful. It's kind of cold today, so I was feeling a little loungy, wearing a sweatshirt instead of a hand-knit sweater and my favorite shawl. I usually like to wear hand-knit sweaters, especially on the podcast here, but I thought I would wear my very favorite shawl. This is a My Chrysalis shawl, and it was my very first brioche project. I'm sure that I have showed this on the podcast at some point. And it's made with Surrey, Surrey alpaca, and a single mohair. And I don't even remember the names. I'll try and figure out what the names of the fibers were and link that below, but you can see it's like a little bit of lace and some brioche, which is, as you know, her brioche knitter reversible. So it's very cool. And it turned out really large, which is how I like my shawls. And so it's perfect for a day at home and being cozy. And it's been lately so sunny and beautiful in Oregon and we've been getting outside a ton, but today it's been cold like right now. It's 37 degrees Fahrenheit, and so I just got in from a lunchtime walk, and so anyway, I will get to the knitting here. Since the last time I recorded a podcast, I have basically become a monogamous knitter, so there's <laughs> there's some content today, but I don't have a long list of finished objects or a long list of whips like I normally do, so that's what happens when you become a monogamous knitter. Um, before I hop into my one finished object to show today, I want to thank everybody that participated in the Books and Berets make along on this channel and on Instagram and on Ravelry, however you participated. Thank you. It was really fun. I ended up making four berets. I will show you the fourth beret soon. And it just was a joy to see other people making berets and enjoying them. But I think the thing that gave me the most joy is on multiple occasions, different people said it reinvigorated their love of reading. Like they maybe were a reader in the past, but had taken a bit of a break and came back to it because of this make along. And that gave me a lot of joy. And then last thing I want to share before I hop into finished objects is since the last time I recorded a podcast, I have also posted a video, which is an interview with my friend Kelly from Le Mouton Rouge Knittery, which is in Bloomington, Illinois. I always forget if she our stores in Bloomington or normal Illinois, but I think it's in Bloomington, Illinois. And she and I met on Zoom and did a little interview, but I also had visited her store in December and had some video footage of the store. And so that's included in there. And the reason I'm mentioning it is she donated a giveaway for that video. So on that video, if you watch it and comment, you'll be entered in a giveaway. And I wanted to mention it here and the giveaway, <laughs> which is there are these pearl strings, which are um, a way to hold your garment on hold. And I'll show that a little bit later, but these ones are for chunkier knits. So if you're knitting in a worsted or bulky or super bulky yarn, you can use this and she mentioned in that interview that these are really size inclusive because they're, they're quite long. And what else do I want to share about it? Oh, I wanted to mention it here because 
to give you time to go check out that video. And so the ne next time I podcast, which I do, I try to do it every two weeks, I will announce the winner from that video on, on the podcast straight away. So I actually do not have a set of the chunky ones. <laughs> I am not entering the giveaway. I'm giving this away, but I, and I said on the video, um, with her that I needed to order some of these and I still do. I still haven't, <laughs> but I think, um, sometimes our purchases are out of necessity. I'm not knitting a bulky cardigan yet, yet I will be. Um, and so anyway, I think these will be really, really, really fun. Um, maybe I'll just pop one out so you can see them. Like, so you can see the cord here is much thicker than kind of the regular pearl string pearl strings. There are other brands like knitting. Is it? I don't have the other brands. So I don't know what they are, but I think it's knitting barber, barber cords. And I think I've seen some other ones too. Um, whatever you choose to use, I think they're really great for garments, really great for garment knitting. Okay. We'll hop into finished objects. I have one finished object, which is a beret. And I wanted to show you it like this, um, not on my head. So you can see that the berets, sometimes they look so tiny. <laughs> I do not have a tiny head. I have a very average head, but it does fit me. And I just think it's so interesting that they look kind of small. Okay. So this is the Jacqueline beret. This is the second Jacqueline beret pattern I've knit. If you watch this podcast, I've also knit a black one, which is really classic. And so then I kind of wanted to do a more wild one. And so this is Clinton Hill Cashmere. And this color is called YOLO. And I think it's so good and bright. Okay. So I love it. I love it so much. I wore this on my walk today. Since it's cold, I wore it over both ears. And I really, I loved it. And I had a really hard time deciding what was the second one I wanted to knit because I wanted to do it in pink, like a hot pink. I think that would be really awesome. And there was also a really beautiful purple color. And ultimately I decided on the yellow for two reasons. Reason one was I watched this show, I watched the show called Emily in Paris and Emily had a yellow beret that like stood out to me. And then reason two was, as for the knit along or the make along, we were reading the book Real Men Knit. You, of course, for the make along books and beret, you can knit, read, knit any beret or read any book you want. But this was the book that we had a Zoom session on and you'll notice this matches the font. And so that was sort of like sealed the deal on what, what color beret I wanted to make. Okay, one last thing about the beret. Um, <laughs> I ended up making quite a few mistakes on this one and it's really interesting because it's the second time I knit it. So what ended up happening, and I'll share more about that in personal information, but I was, hanging out with Anna from Zebra Yarns and we were at an outdoor playground with our children. I have a four-year-old daughter, Matilda, and she has a four-year-old daughter as well. And they were playing and she, and Anna's the queen of walking and knitting. Like she walks everywhere and can knit. And so I was trying to walk and knit as well. And I did the pattern wrong. And so then after I did the pattern wrong, I didn't realize it. And I won't share how I did the pattern wrong. Um, so yeah, cause the pattern's not free, <laughs> but I made a subtle but important mistake in the decreases. And I didn't realize it until I was home and finishing it and I didn't have enough yarn to finish. And I was like, how do I not have enough yarn to finish the spray? I made one already. And then I saw the mistake I made. So I back and then when I ripped it back I must not have found the beginning around perfectly so the amount of stitches between each of the decreases was not the same so it's not perfectly symmetrical but you can't really tell I have 
quite a bit more yarn left over than the last braid I made. And so my last braid I used almost every nugget up. So I'm thinking my little mistake made a, a change in the braid. But it looks super good on still and I really enjoy it. And I don't think that this will be my last beret I make. <laughs> I do think I'm gonna take a bit of a break from berets this month, although it's the end of the month, <laughs> so that I can focus on my test knit, which I'll show, show soon. Before I show my, my test knit, I do wanna show, just for accountability, <laughs> that beginning of the year I said I wanted to keep a notebook of my finished objects because I have not been the best about taking finished object photos. And I haven't been the best at putting those projects on Ravelry or on Instagram. And so I wanted this year to be the year that I actually like took pictures of all my finished objects and recorded them. And I mostly have done that. I have not put this in yet, but other than this, I have, I'll just show a couple pages. So I have my Jacqueline Bray. I made a purple beret. There's my blue beret. I have a spout where I, I started this. I actually cast this on on a beach and so I wrote it down and I put a picture of me casting it on. So I have, I'm keeping the notebook. I have recorded so far and it's nearly the end of February. So we're two months in. That's amazing for me. <laughs> going to share my one work in progress. I have basically been a monogamous knitter working on one work in progress. It's not like me at all. I normally work on multiple things. Other than finishing this little beret, I have mostly just worked on this one item. And I'm really, really proud of myself for that. Um, the last time I podcasted, I mentioned that I get to participate in a sweater test knit, my very first sweater test knit, and it's the Souffle Tea by Laura from Penrose Knits. And the last time I, I think I showed the yarn, and so I'm knitting out of Murray and Company, Murray Wool and Company, their mohair, and my colorway is called Wine Tasting, which is, you can see the whites and pinks and reds that you might have in a wine tasting in there. There's some very, like, kind of berry colors, and, you know, I think sometimes red wine can look like that, like almost like a, a beautiful fuchsia. So I think that this color is really awesome. And I had shared the last podcast that in the Tessa group, I think I'm the only one doing a variegated yarn. So I was a little nervous, but I really liked the way it turned out. I didn't finish it. I, I really did actually try hard to finish it, but <laughs> here we go. So last time I recorded, I was up here, which is where the mohair is held single. And then down here, the mohair is switch to doubles to create a different fabric. And this is my first time ever knitting with mohair held double. So since it's two lace weights held together, that makes like a fingering. I mean, of course I've knit a fingering sweater, but I've never, it's so, so squishy. And in the camera, it's like you almost can't tell that there's two different kinds of fabric here. And it's sort of like that in person too. But when I try it on, you can tell that this is more sheer than what's down here. I think it's going to be epic. There's still a lot of work left to do on it. I am to a point on it right now where I'm doing a folded hem. And I, it's like the worst possible spot to be in when you're recording right now like I'm mid hemming like I'm here <laughs> and like I this much is hemmed like this much and the rest it's going slow 
to do the folded hem, but not in a bad way, in a very enjoyable way, just making sure it looks good. All right, before I discuss the folded hem situation, I will talk about the yarn and my strategy for dealing with variegated. So I was very nervous about odd pooling that might happen on this. And so I had four skeins of fingering and you hold it double. So I had these two and then I alternated another two and I alternated. And the fabric that's up here is the fabric I like the most. That's, I loved the way that looked. And even though I was alternating skeins, and my gauge not be appearing to change the as the sweater went on even though i was alternating there started to be these kind of like wider changes variations and i know that some people that knit socks and things like they're just like with their hand knit socks are like i don't care it doesn't bother me that color variation um and i would say i would feel that way about socks as well on a garment that I'm putting my body, I feel, don't feel quite that like carefree about it because I, I want it to look intentional and also, I don't know. And so what I guess I'm saying is when that started to happen, when these started to spread out a lot and I wasn't liking the look of that, I actually ended up switching from alternating skeins to just knitting this, just these two. And when I did that, it switched back to kind of closer, but even a little stripe. So there's kind of sort of three situations happening. You can see there's this kind of fabric and then the fabric where it started to kind of pull out more and then smaller stripes because when I switched to only one ink. And I like that better because now it doesn't look, it just looks unique where it was closer together, kind of wider and then smaller here. And so, and that's also worked out really nice for the folded hem because now I'm only using one set of yarns instead of alternating on the folded hem. And I do think this design is 100% best in a solid, like I, a solid color, like the ones I'm seeing in the Testnet group look epic, but I do not regret my choice. I do think it's going to be really unique piece and with a variegated yarn like this like it's going to look handmade which I really like but not in like a kitschy or kind of quirky way like it's going to look maybe a little quirky but it's not going to look um still going to look professional and nice but it's definitely not something you would ever be able to buy a store which is something I appreciate out of a handmade garment so I all I'd say is I'm very glad about my choice, but I also want to make a solid one later. <laughs> Even if I used a solid yarn, I tend to buy a lot of hand dyed yarn. I would still alternate skeins. And about alternating skeins, I created a YouTube tutorial about it. And I, and I also this weekend made a Instagram reel because I was thinking about how this is a really great, easy method, but my YouTube video on how to do it is like maybe, I don't know how many minutes it is. It's not very long, particularly compared to these podcasts, but let's just say it's like 10 minutes long or something. Some people don't like a 10 minute tutorial, so I made like a 40 second reel on Instagram as well. And so I'll link both of those if you're interested in how I alternated yarns. So yeah. I'm so pleased. So last time I podcasted, I asked for some advice around test knitting. And I think Alexandra from Fiberbound, she gave the advice for test knitting a sweater that you should like set goals. So this is a five week test knit. So I should think about like what I wanna accomplish each week of the test knit. And that's really great. And so I was thinking how week one, I wanted to slip for sleeves, done. Week two, I wanted to do the body, almost done. I'm, like I said, I'm in the hem. And then week three, I was thinking I could try to get the sleeves done. Week four would be the finishing touches, like the ruffle and the I-cord. And then that gives me a week five of grace to like, 
kind of like catch up. The Rose City Yarn Crawl is this weekend and I really wanted to wear this at the Rose City Yarn Crawl. That would mean I would need to finish this in the next two days. That is not realistic for me. I know that's realistic for some knitters, but I just, knowing yourself, like, there's not a lot quantity left of knitting, but there is like finishing touches left, like an eye cord and a ruffle. And I know that while those aren't very time consuming, in terms of like the quantity, like I want to like and slow down and enjoy that process and not rush it. And so it looks nice. So anyway, really excited. And that's my only whip, the only thing I worked on. So what? <laughs> oh, so about the folded hem. So there's a folded hem at the bottom. That is not my first time doing a folded hem. My first time doing a folded hem was when I was pregnant, I made this dress for Matilda. Well, it's not really a dress, it's kind of like a, a jumper situation, like you wear something underneath. Where's this cute little band here? Some pleats. And then there's this really sweet pico hem at the bottom. And I, the first time I, so I made this and I remember thinking, goodness, I'm learning so much in such a tiny, tiny dress. Uh, I think this was the first time I had done an eye cord edging and also the first time I had done a folded hem, the pico. And the first time I did something like this, what I did is I sat at my kitchen table, like there was, this was not TV knitting, and I was very nervous about lining it up because you basically fold it and knit your stitches into a pearl bump and I was nervous about lining it all up. But it was very easy when I was focused and it turned out great, like quite, it turned out perfect. And, and even though she was a tiny baby, it was nice to have something like this made because then when she, when I didn't have as much time, when she was a baby, didn't it? Um, I, and she grew, I had things kind of in reserve for her already made. So that was the first time I did a folded hem. And the second time I knit for her, a folded hem was when I knit her a skirt. And I was thinking the first time I knit with cashmere was my brays. I was truly thinking that. And when I started thinking about folding, folded hems, I realized that wasn't true. <laughs> the first time I knit with cashmere, for Matilda and actually some people that are like very like in my knitting group in the area or when I used to go to knitting group in the before times um they were like, some of them kind of gave me a hard time about knitting Matilda a cashmere skirt because you know she's a tiny human and this isn't exactly washable like machine washable and whatever but I was like you know I don't care like do it gives you joy. I knit Matilda a cashmere skirt. It is what it is. And what was really nice about a folded hem skirt, a folded hem and this, this folded hem is really similar to what I'm doing. As you can see, it doesn't have a pico edge. It just has that kind of nice, like a pearl bump at the bottom. So this one's a better fabric to see it in than what I'm doing, which is why I wanted to show it. And What was nice about both of these folded hems is with, especially with like kind of a, a skirt is it gives it a little bit of structure and weight. I mean, obviously it's not heavy, but it's just like enough weight that it keeps it from like kind of folding up. Yeah, and it looks really nice. And actually just side note, the skirt's really nice to knit for a child because it's like has a very elastic waist with like a, with the ribbing and then it has these drawstrings. And so if you make it long enough, it can fit the child for quite a long time. Matilda wore this from like, like one and a half until almost three. So I forgot about it. <laughs> okay, 
So I wanted to show those folded hems instead of mine because mine was mid way through. But the this folded hem is for me a little bit harder because it's mohair and and it's a larger circ circumference. So it's one thing when your circumference is just like a, a child's thing. I guess this is pretty wide, but I don't know, mine feels much larger. So I'm really enjoying my test knit a lot for so many different reasons. I, but one of the reasons I'm really enjoying it is I enjoying the process of knitting that sweater. It is a nice blend of like skills and fun things to do like a folded hem and I'm gonna have an eye cord edging. Like those are like skills to do, which are fun. But also there was parts that were like kind of monotonous knitting, which is really nice for watching TV, like the body of the sweater. So I've enjoyed that and I know I'm gonna love the finished project, the finished product of it to wear it. So yeah, it would be so nice to have it on the Rosie Yarn Crawl because this is what I was envisioning. It's not gonna happen, but imagine this. This with this. I actually think this is the perfect combo. This sweater with this beret. Like I really, truly do. <laughs> oh, talking about like pearl strings and barber cords or the knitted barber cords. I use those on the sleeves. And so the other thing I did when I was working on this is I would try it on frequently. And so I had those on the sleeves and I would also use them here on the bottom. And basically all you do all you, to use them, all you have to do is you essentially just attach the cord here on the tip and then you can pull the, the needle through and then they're all on the cords. Or what I often do is I just put it on the tip and kind of just go like this and leave the needles. I don't pull them out. I just leave them as sort of the way to catch the stitches for what I'm trying trying it on. So this section of the podcast is the professor's pearls, which are my reflections and connections between my career as a professor and knitting. So today's reflection is about test knitting and rejection. And sort of the impetus for this reflection is that in the past week, I had both a rejection in my career and also a rejection in my knitting world. And so what I mean by rejection in my career is this. In academics, our, as a professor, like there's so many rejections, meaning, there's grants rejected, there's articles rejected. Uh, a professor's life is really, really full of rejection. So professors will have a CV and oftentimes on that CV, there's like a list of publications. And it's just really interesting because what an outsider sees is a lot of success. Like, oh, look at all these articles or oh, look at these awards. But for every article that's published, there was like, I don't know, multiple rejections before that, I promise you, for every professor. And so there's this sort of like normalization and rejection. And early on in my career as a graduate student, I remember the first time I had a paper rejected, I was quite upset and I cried. And then it's never again have I cried over a rejection because it's like, it's so normal and it's so it's part of the process. So, all that really prepared me well for when I decided that I wanted to test knit for the first time. So the first time I applied for a test knit was maybe two years ago and I was rejected and I wasn't like really upset about it. Like I was just sort of like, Oh, okay. They, they didn't pick me. And I think why wasn't I picked? Like, I think like I wasn't very active on Instagram. You know, I, you know, I don't know. I 
just a year ago, I only had like a hundred followers on Instagram. So I didn't have like much of an audience. I don't even know, maybe my account was public or not. That was probably really important. But, um, so, I mean, I didn't post regularly. And so I'm thinking, you know, if I'm applying for a certain test knit and then designer has multiple people for the same slot, they'd probably want to pick the person that's like active on social media. I assume, I don't know. Um, and so it's not about me per se, this rejection on testnet. It's more about like what the designer needs than about me, but it would be easy to make it about myself, you know, like, so I share that because I was recently just talking to one of my friends about this testnet and I was telling her about how much I love this testnet and I said, everybody should do a testnet. And then she said, oh, I would love to, I've applied, but I, you know, for very, not this one, but she's applied for various test nets and she hasn't been picked. And then I remembered what it was like before I had a podcast or even my small Instagram following that I have when I applied for test nets over and over and was rejected. And I was like, oh my goodness, I remember thinking it's not that easy to get accepted. I share all that to say. This summer, I was accepted for my first test knit. I did the Ruse Cobini, and then I did a pair of self-striping socks, and then I did the Kuse Hula socks. So I had done three sort of test knits. One for Annie, two for Annie Huti knits, and then my third for um, Pacific Northwest Pearls. So then this is my fourth test knit, this sweater. And I, the joy that I've received, like in terms of like, is so much bigger because I had that rejection. Like I'm actually like so thankful for that rejection or prior rejections because it helps me appreciate these experiences so much more knowing that that they aren't expected, they're a gift. And also this week, I was enjoying, this past week, I was enjoying this test knit from Laura so much. Like one, the test knit itself, like the actual knitting itself I was enjoying. But two, the group, like she has a group um, Instagram where we can talk back and forth with, with each other has been just so supportive, kind, encouraging, like all the cheesy things, just, it's been so good. And people are showing their progress, people are encouraging, and it made me love this test knit so much that I was like, I need to test knit another sweater. And so I applied for another test knit and I was not picked. And I was like, that's right. These things are not guaranteed. And I'm not sad that I wasn't picked, but I did want to make it transparent that I wasn't picked because I think the more we normalize things like rejection, that's such a good thing because I can remember watching podcasts before I had a podcast and thinking it's not that easy to get picked for a test net. And I'm here to say, maybe it's not. Like, <laughs> I know that that's maybe a different message that from what other people might say, but you know, it, I've been rejected more from test nets than I have been selected. That's, that's a fact. <laughs> and it's the same in my academic career. I've been rejected more for my articles than I have had articles accepted. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's not that I don't have a great math career. I do, and I, my knitting experience is very enjoyable, but Rejection is inherently part of that. And so it's like, what do you do with that rejection? Like, um, don't sit around and be sad about it. <laughs> Move on and, you know, and still support the designer. So in, I'm actually not going to mention the designers that have rejected me from their test sets because I still support them. And I don't think it's anything wrong to not pick somebody. I think designers have tough decisions to make and they need to do what's best for their design. And, but what I have noticed is when it's a good fit for both people is when it's great. 
And so I'm actually thinking about making a video on, on tips for applying to test netting and also tips for um, participating in a test net. And so one of the tips that I'll just give today is just keep trying. Like uh, Dory on Finding Nemo, just keep swimming. Just keep trying. You will find a test net for you when the time is right, just like I did. Somebody will pick you and it'll be awesome. And so anyway, I would love to know sort of your test knitting experience as much as you feel comfortable sharing in the comments of YouTube below. But I, you know, like, have you gotten selected for every single test knit you've, you have applied for or have you been rejected from some? And how do you find the designers that you um, apply for their test knits? I, that's one of the questions that one of my friends asked me and my answer to her was too much time on Instagram for me, <laughs> like, and <laughs> no joke about that. But um, yeah, so I'd love to know sort of your thoughts around that. Okay, speaking of test nets, I've decided to do something brave and bold for me, <laughs> which is I showed this sock on the last podcast, which is a mohair sock. And I have actually written up this pattern. And I didn't write it up just for my size. I wrote it up for a size smaller than mine and a size larger. Again, it looks really small because it's essentially ribbing. And I am going to try and publish this on Ravelry and that feels very uncomfortable to say. <laughs> and so I need some test knitters and it feels really scary and vulnerable to say, but yeah, I would love, love to have some test knitters and everybody's welcome. So if you've never test knit anything before, this would probably make a really great first test knit. Um, if you've never knit a sock before, like you're welcome. It's a DK sock essentially. And if you're hesitant because it's mohair, don't let that stop you. So I knit this out of a sparkle sock and a mohair. And a fingering held with a mohair creates a DK weight. So you actually don't have to knit this sock as a mohair sock. You could knit this sock with just DK yarn and that would be fine. And, or you can knit this with um, fingering and mohair. And so for the testers that are applying for this test knit, I'm actually interested in both. I'm interested in people who are willing to do it in mohair so that they can tell me how much mohair they use. Like, I'm just wondering like, is this enough? Can people use their mohair scraps? They have left over from a sweater to make a pair of mohair socks. Like. So just the weight of amount of mohair that you use in this is like very important for me to know. So I'm interested in people who will do this in mohair, but I'm also really interested in people that don't want to do this in mohair and want to do this just in DK. And so like one of the things I'm really interested in is weights of yarn, like how much yarn is used. And I would love to know that from testers. Also readability of pattern, also fit of the sock. Like those are things I'm interested in. And yeah, so if you are interested in applying for it, I um, will have a Google link below. So there's a description bar, click it. And there's a, like a link for a Google form that you can fill out to test net this. And um, yeah, and I, in the form I have some questions like wanting to know like just so I can make sense and of like for instance like what size like it, have you knit your sock experience what size socks do you normally knit um if they're fingering weight if this is your first DK weight um are you interested in doing it in mohair or are you more interested in doing it in DK I want to have a mix people willing to do this and so 
For the test knit, you only need to do one sock. You don't need to do both socks. And I think that's funny because that's sort of who I am as a human, is I typically only knit one sock and not the second sock. <laughs> um, and so of course my test knit would be like that too, but you know, the a DK weight sock does knit much faster than a fingering weight. So there's that. So all the details for like applying and things like that are um, below. I'm going to announce this test knit both here on YouTube and on Instagram. It will be published here on YouTube first, mainly because I'm a little bit scared to put myself out there like in this way and asking for test centers. I don't, it's okay to be scared anyway. So I'm just being a little brave and I have not, I will announce it on Instagram, but it'll be after YouTube. So see, see how my YouTube people respond first. <laughs> so anyway, um, really excited about that. Thank you for considering that. All right, next I want to talk about an upcoming make-along. I mentioned on my last episode that I was wondering if anybody would be interested in a scrappy sweater make-along. And I also mentioned it on Instagram and both on YouTube and on Instagram was a lot of response that people would be interested in it so it's official we're having a scrappy sweater make along and this is going to be the most low-key make along of make alongs first of all it's the make along so crochet and knitting is welcome second it will go from March 1st to September 1st which I know is like a long time but the thought there is I just thought it would be really nice to have a make along that like really embraces the premise of like slow fashion, slow knitting, just enjoying the process and not feeling rushed to finish something. And so it is quite a long one. And I was thinking that I'm not really a blanket knitter and people knit all these kind of and crochet these scrappy blankets so the scrappy sweater for me will be just this thing that I keep working on slowly eventually finish but there's no deadline or timeline on scrappy sweater make along third of the scrappy sweater make along is whips are welcome so if you've already started a scrappy sweater join on in <laughs> if you want and fourth is that we'll run this both on Ravelry and on Instagram. However, on Ravelry, there will be no finished object thread. It'll just be a chatter thread. And so I'll open that up on March 1st. And the hashtag for Instagram is going to be scrappy sweater along. So if you choose to join in, do that. And they, I'm planning to do monthly Zooms for it so that we can get together and just have a knit night, knit night around our scrappy sweaters. So bring your scrappy sweater and work on it. And I was thinking I might cast on a sea glass sweater for the scrappy sweater along and maybe only work on it in those knit night zooms together once a month. And we'll see if I actually do that, but that's one of my thoughts. And so if you're interested in how to get zoom info, like I'm, I will post it in two locations and I, one location I will post the scrappy sweater knit along information will be the zoom. Oh my gosh. If you're interested in where I will post the zoom information, it will be in two locations. Location one will be in a Ravelry thread around the scrappy, scrappy sweater make along. That's one place I've posted zoom links before for getting together. And then the other place I will post a Zoom link will be in my Instagram stories. So basically, uh, I will announce on Instagram like when the Zoom will be, and then I usually put the link in the stories. And then that way, it's not like a like a permanent link that anybody can just click on. It's like people who are like following me as a knitter. So that being said. Um, you can find me on Instagram as Prof Pearl, and you can find me on Ravelry as Prof Pearl as well. And yeah, so 
all the information for the objects and the things I talk about and also this make along I put in show notes in a description bar below here if you're interested and in terms of the zoom I actually like have a work account and like a, a zoom program for my work but I like want to keep this like knitting stuff like separate and so I have created a separate zoom account for this YouTube channel the professor of pearl podcast and it's so that has been partially supported by viewers through ko-fi and partially funded through me as well and so yeah if you're interested in that there is a ko-fi link below as well and that's just a way to kind of help support for some of the kind of like expenses of the channel like you know zoom and shipping costs and prices and things like that and so that's super appreciated yeah so anyway i look very much forward to this very low key like make long that's more focused on community so it was intentional to not have a finished object thread in ravelry like for this make along just so we can focus on the community aspect of us getting together i have not officially planned the zoom the first zoom but i was leaning towards doing it on march 1st which is the um, it's the kickoff, the, 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 um, the start of the make along. I think I hadn't officially planned it yet because I keep going back and forth because so far for the different make alongs, I've done a YouTube live on the first day. And so I was thinking I could do a YouTube live to kind of like talk about the make along and then have a zoom later in the month. So anyway, I'm still kind of working those details out, but March 1st is the date. So let me know in the comments below if you plan on participating in this scrappy sweater along and if you do, like what do you plan on doing? And as you can tell, like it's very like low key. So like definitions of scraps is maybe it's almost a full scale, but it's a scrap that's left over from a project and you plan on using it in sweaters, like that counts as a scrappy sweater. So Somebody asked me on Instagram, do short sleeve sweaters count? Yes. So any scrappy sweater is welcome. I have one acquisition to share. And this acquisition is a gift. And I feel like I need to share like a little, even though I like to save the personal stuff for the end. I feel like I need to share a little bit of personal stuff here in order to like provide context of the gift, which is Anna from Zebra Yarns and I have hung out before, like just one time we um, met online <laughs> thanks to Knitstagram and YouTube and she's about my age and has a four-year-old daughter and I have a four-year-old daughter and so yeah, we hung out and went to a museum together and it was really awesome. And so since I last podcasted, we went to an air and space museum with our daughters and I was like unsure how it would go because it's definitely a museum that's for adults. Like there's not children exhibits and it's just lots and lots of airplanes and yeah, it's just not a children's museum, but the girls loved it, loved it, loved it. And then there's like a, a wonderful playground on there. And we actually hung out yesterday again, Anna and I and her daughter and, and Matilda. We went to like an indoor sort of like bounce house, like, I don't know, playground with mats and slides and trampolines. Like, I don't know, it was, I don't know how to describe it, but <laughs> other than it was epic if you're four. <laughs> and so anyway, we've hung out and it's been really fun, not just for me, but for Matilda, like, you know, like she's an only child and then Anna's daughter's an only child and they're both four and so they play and then Anna and I like hang out and chase our kids and Anna walks and knits, which is really impressive. I try to walk and knit, but I mean, and I can just not to her level. She's the queen. Anyway, after hanging out together at the Air and Space Museum, her and her daughter were like, oh, we've got a, a book for Matilda in the car. And then Anna surprised me with a gift for me. For me, and I was 
beside myself and this thing okay first of all that's a little mini bag with like a purple zipper and maybe you can't tell on the screen but this part of the bag is glitter and this fabric is like knit stitches and there's little like glitter things on it and I didn't look to see if this is a bag maker on Etsy or whatever but I'll search and it says stitch below here the tag anyway it's a really cute bag and I don't have a lot of knitting bags. I mostly keep my stuff in baskets, but it's like so nice to have a knitting bag. And so, yeah, now I have a few, <laughs> but because it's like my third sock bag. So, um, yeah, it was really exciting. And so, and then look. What? So, Anna is a self striping dyer. There's her logo, Zebra Yarns. And look, it's a little progress keeper. Like, can you even? Like, this was her just hanging out at the museum gift to me. I thought that was so sweet. Um, so this is going to be my reward for finishing my test knit. So I just, I can't. It was just... Yeah, so I think like she dyes all kinds of yarn, but I do think that she's like most like well known for like her two stripe, self striping socks. So that's pink and white, totally my colors, matches the bag. And then I'll use these for like the heels. <sighs> that was so amazing. Anyway, thank you, Anna. What a treasure. So. sort of a mix of acquisitions and personal life. So now it's full-blown personal life. So if you aren't here for the full personal things with no knitting, there's no more knitting content from this point forward. <laughs> I'm actually gonna show a stack of books here. So in the last two weeks, I've finished three books, which seems like a lot, but I read multiple books at a time. So sometimes you, you, you finish them all at once. So I finished Real Men Knit just in time for our book discussion and the end of the Books and Bray make along. It is a full blown romance, but not like Hallmark cheesy romance, like spicy. Uh, the characters I really enjoyed. There's these brothers, their last name's Strong, and they end up being owners of this yarn store, Strong Knits, when their mother, Mama Joy, dies. and. Anyway, I really like the characters a lot. And so even though it's a little out of my comfort zone for my types of reading I do, like I will be reading the second one that comes out next month. This is going to be a series. And so, yes, it's a very cozy, romance, spicy story. So if you're into that, it might be a book you enjoy. I think I've mentioned that I'm a huge Sarah J Maas fan and so I finished this book this big thick book how many pages is this it's a 600 something page book so it's a long book I finished it I read the first book A Court of Thorns and Roses three times Let's just say I really like the characters in there. And this book rocked me. Completely rocked me because characters that I loved in book that first book, I no longer loved. Characters, I was heartbroken. Like I needed to talk to somebody about it. I persevered. I ended up falling in love with some characters that I didn't like in book one, loving in book two. And I want to reread this desperately. Like... I almost like finished it and wanted to like start it over but I am to the point where I like have to know what happens so I'm in book three <laughs> I started book three uh, which is a court of wings and ruin I think that's it yeah yeah court of wings and ruin yeah. but I know I'm gonna go back and read this reread this at some point if you are a Sarah J Moss fan and you made it this far in the video, please tell me something about Sarah J Moss below in the comments. I literally like 
or message me on Instagram. I really need some Sarah J Moss friends in my life. These series that she writes are everything. I love them so much. Um, on my Kindle from the library, I read a book called, what was it? <laughs> Midnight Library. And I think I first heard about this book when I was watching the One More Row podcast with Carrie and Kay from the Crazy Sock Lady. I think Kay might have been reading it and it's really, I, if you're somebody who likes to highlight things in your book or you can highlight on Kindle and save your highlights and notes, like this is the book for you. Like even though it's a fiction book, like it had so many like just one-liners or paragraphs that were just like, I, I needed to highlight them. They were so good. And in a way it sort of ended in a way you might expect but also it was really interesting. Oh, I never explained sort of the premise, which is basically this person ends up in a library where they are trying on different lives. Like there's a book of regrets and they have some regrets. And what if, think about something you might regret in your life. And like, what if you went back to that regret and did it differently? Like your life would turn out different. And so this person is trying on different lives. And it was really fascinating because one of the lives is really um, my life right now. <laughs> and so that was interesting. And then other lives were just like so out there. Like, you know, she was like a glaciologist in Antarctica. Like, so anyway, I just, it's a good book. I really liked it. I would totally recommend it. Um, so yeah, those are the books I read. And it seems like I was just sitting around reading or something, but not at all. I just read multiple books at a time. On that note, I mentioned I'm reading A Court of Wings and Ruin. And I'm also reading Night Circus on my Kindle. I just started that like last night. Also a recommendation from somebody. I just checked this out from my library, The Hate You Give. I'm really excited to read this. And my mom sent me another Sarah J Maas book in the mail. So Sarah J Maas has multiple series. So one series is a Throne of Glass series, which I'm reading, love it. Another series is of Court of Thrones and Roses. Another series is Crescent City. And this book came out this month and it's the second book in um, the Crescent City series. And I, it's just there's too much to read but i definitely i definitely want to this is I'm not reading it but i kind of wondering if i should start the crescent city series I, I just it's too much these books are just so thick if you like series fantasy all right so that's kind of the reading situation that's just part of it i just read so much at one time i i wish i could just be one of those people that focuses on one book but it's just it's never going to happen um, since the last time I recorded, Kyle and I, so there's been two weekends. So two weekends ago, we took Matilda to Lincoln City. We went to a couple beaches out there. It was really cold and windy, which is like the stereotypical, like Oregon coast situation that you hear about, <laughs> but it wasn't raining. And so we had a good time outside. Lincoln City, if you're not from this area, is a I'm kind of well known for putting these glass floats out like they hide them out on the beach and you can like go try and look for them and find them and we didn't find any but I do know people that have found some and um, yeah and it's just something fun to do on the beach even if you don't find any is to look for them so we did that and th that was sort of part of our like our like I keep saying it's an unspoken family goal, but now it hasn't been spoken a lot by us multiple times, which is every weekend we are aiming to go on some sort of hike or outdoor activity. So we did that two weekends ago. And then this weekend we did a hike near us. So we didn't want to have to drive far for like a, a hike, like in the gorge or by Mount Hood or something like this. So we 
searched for hikes near us and there was one actually in our town that we live in that we've never done before. I mean, it was a short loop, like two miles, but it was beautiful, the tall trees, there were signs about different birds to look for and it was perfect to bring Matilda on and we got outside and we did it, so that was nice. Um, that paired with the fun I've had with Anna and her daughter from Seabury Harns it's been a really fun two weeks. We've had a, we've had a really good time and yeah, so I guess I, I, I mean, I've been reading a lot and I mean, even though I only have one whip, I mean, this is, I'm so proud of myself. That's a lot for two weeks. There's some people in the test net that actually like finished their whole sweater already in two weeks. This is totally a sweater you could knit in two weeks if you wanted because it's really interesting, but it um, didn't happen for me because I was too busy having fun doing other things. <laughs> so anyway, um, it's spring comes early where I live here. I already have some flowers blooming in my yard and I took some pictures of flowers on my walks that I've had recently. We do go on walks every day, not necessarily hikes, but we go for uh, an outdoor walk every day and it's just, I can tell spring's on its way, even though it's like cold today, you know, flowers are blooming and things like that. And so it's just, it's a beautiful time. So anyway, thanks so much for joining me here today and watching them and supporting this podcast. It means so much. And I really hope that you consider participating in the scrappy sweater make along. It'd be really fun to actually see you like on a zoom, or you can just participate virtually in Instagram, but it would just be fun to get to know you by the sweater you're making and yeah so I hope you have a great week and talk to you soon